All right, hello out there. Welcome to another episode of WP Roundtable. Um, we're glad to be on again with a great guest this week. Um, I'm Kellen Mace. I'm a freelance developer um, in Detroit area in Michigan, and um, soon soon to be Ten Up or like our uh, guest today, uh, President and Founder of Ten Up. And I'm Rich. I'm a freelance developer and web development teacher from Cleveland, Ohio area. Jason. Jason. Didn't do it. <laughs> My name is Jason Crawford. I'm coming to you from Medellin, Colombia, and I'm also excited to be on with our guest tonight. Hey, guys. I'm Kyle Maurer, and I'm a web developer and uh, co-founder of Real Big Marketing based in Jackson, Michigan, and make stuff with WordPress. And uh, I'm really, really happy to be here today. Today is special for a couple of reasons. For one, it's a milestone for us. This is our 50th episode of WP Roundtable, so... You know, give ourselves like a little, just quick round of applause, guys. We made 50 episodes. Um, that's exciting. And for this milestone, we couldn't have gotten a better guest. Um, I've been really, really excited about this episode for a long, long time. Um, we've got one of my personal heroes, Mr. Jake Goldman, the uh, president and founder of a company called 10 Up. They're a really elite WordPress agency. Um, so I'm going to let Mr. Golden kind of just say hello and um, add anything to his introduction worth noting, and we'll move forward with questions. I don't think I can add anything to that introduction. I mean, it's only downhill from I'm one of your heroes. <laughs> uh, as you said, I run an agency, a shop called 10 Up, and I'm excited to be talking to all of you. Well, we are super glad to have you here. Yeah, thanks a lot for being on. Um, next up, we'll move into our uh, picks of the week, just something interesting that, um, that came up within the past week. Um, something I was going to note, um, especially because we have uh, Jake on tonight from 10 Up, I thought it would be really appropriate to mention, as a pick of the week, um, the engineering best practices. Um, this is These were open sourced, I think, about a half a year ago. Uh, 10 Up decided some um, best practices they had for, uh, for developers um, in-house, that they were going to open source those and make them available to the community. Um, it's a really great read if you're a developer on this, this series of pages. They're on a GitHub page. Um, uh, or publicly accessible site, I should say. It's uh, 10up.github.io slash engineering best practices with hyphens between them. Um, it's really great um, in terms of uh, PHP and JavaScript best practices that, that they use, um, also the structure and, um, and workflow you know, of building sites, um, and also some of the tools recommended and stuff like that. So give it a look-see. And my pick of the week is something that was rolled out by Mark Jayquith last week called Cash Buddy. It's kind of a complement to uh, some of the tools out there like WP Super Cash, W3 Total Cash. And what it does is for uh, login users, uh, for people that have, uh, for users to have commented on a website, a lot of times you can't cache those pages. But uh, Mark's been doing all kinds of uh, back-end tricks with JavaScript to work around that. Well, he decided to release this as a, as a plug-in. Now, it's not good for anybody with BuddyPress or e-commerce. Just, there's just too much going on there. But if you have a, if you have a blog, a uh, lot of comments, things like that, uh, it, it's a great tool to supplement the already good tools out there to try to get your, uh, your cache hits as uh, clean as possible. So check it out in the repository. It's called Cash Buddy by Mark Jaquith. All right. My pick Thanks of the week this week is uh, CloudPress. Uh, that's over at cloudpress.com. Uh, I'm sorry, cloud-press.net. And it's basically a new theme that is very similar in a lot of ways to what I use over at Headway, but it's got some extremely uh, new stuff going on. So basically you can have a dev site and a live site simultaneously and transfer uh, transfer the information back and forth seamlessly, at least supposedly. Now, this is in beta mode. They have a discount for uh, beta testing. Uh, it's not the cheapest thing I've ever seen, at least you know, not if you're going to be doing a lot with it. But I'd, I'd say it's pretty cool to check out. It's, they've got a lot of uh, really neat and innovative ideas over there, and we'll uh, I'll be watching it to see how they come up. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Um, so I've got uh, actually two things that I want to mention real quick. One, um, as is the case with all uh, WordPress news, if you want to get uh, the, the best article and the best write-up on, on whatever's going on, you've got to go over to poststatus.com. 
And uh, there's an article about the WordPress lead developer, Andrew Nason, taking on a role at the um, U.S. Digital Service. So he's working um, with the White House. Um, Andrew Nason has been the lead developer of WordPress, working at Audrey Capital for a few years. And I've met him, met him on a couple of occasions. And he's a, a brilliant guy who's contributed so much to this open source project and is kind of um, going in somewhat of a, at least in a, for temporary purposes, in a new direction. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Um, and I also just wanted to uh, recommend that uh, anybody listening take a look at HeroPress.com again. A former guest of the show, Topher DeRosia, a friend of ours, is still working on the Hero Press project and doing some cool things with it. Um, they're uh, producing some really cool essays, uh, the first of which has been published um, and was really fantastic. So I'll leave it at that. Just check out HeroPress.com and see what they're doing. Really cool stuff. So, um, Jake, do you have something to share? Sure. So I was going to also recommend Cash Buddy. I'll fall back a little. I'm sure it's... I bet it's already been recommended, but if you haven't signed up for the Post Status Newsletter in the Post Status Membership Club, I, Brian uh, Crosgard has been steadily churning out content there, putting out a newsletter every day. I read it every single day. I always learn something from it. If you have to take the time to sign up, I really recommend you do it. And, you, know, you subscribe and get the newsletter in your inbox. That's a great suggestion. Right on. Um, okay, so this is a this is our chance to get to know Mr. Goldman a little bit better, so um, we're going to dive into our questions, and we've got a lot of them. So, uh, Jake, I was hoping that we could kind of a little bit set the stage just in case, on the far-off chance that there's anybody watching who isn't too familiar with you and your story. There's plenty of other interviews that you've done, WordPress talk, WordCamp talks, and um, podcasts that you've been a guest on, um, but could you give us maybe the, the quick version of what you were doing before 10 Up? A quick story of you starting that business and then the several years since then that bring us up to date. Sure. Let's see if I can do the abbreviated version here. So I'd spent probably about 10 to 14 years before starting 10 up in contracting shops and agency shops. So I'm sort of a long time, in some sense, veteran of being a consultant, being a contractor, being in the agency world. I've been doing web, I like to say since there was a web was, that there was to develop on, so I've really almost always been focused on web technology in my career, at least the intersections of web technology, probably too many years more than I'd care to admit doing things like Flash and Cold Fusion along the way. Um, the few years leading up to 10 up, I was at a shop that was predominantly working with closed source proprietary content management systems. I really needed to pivot out of that because I don't think they were making them successful. So I took on an initiative to really look at how we could use tools like WordPress to be more of the center of their strategy, help that team pivot their business model. Around the beginning of 2011, it became clear to me that it was time to, for me to do something new. It was time for me to go in a different direction. Um, it was time for me to you know, get around to owning my own company um, and building my own team based on the connections I have. So I started 10 up. I started at a time when I felt like WordPress was really on the upswing, where I had a lot of connections, relationships some esteem in that community and decided to make sort of creating great experiences on that platform the center of what I did. Um, so I started the company, I like to say in retrospect, that having spent seven years prior in management positions at agencies that I thought I would you know, take a nice break for a year from hiring, from being responsible for payroll, for being responsible for other people and maybe have a few contractors but really just work independently. As the story goes, could opportunities knocked on my door? It's hard when TechCrunch and 9to5Mac and other interesting companies show up asking for help. It's hard to say no to those if you know you want to build a company over time. So within six months of starting the company, we made our first hire, our first full-time hire. By the end of the first year, I think we had seven or eight full-time uh, employees. And uh, as WordPress's trajectory uh, hockey pucked in terms of intro, you know, hockey stick, not hockey puck. Hockey stick in, ter stick in terms of interest. Uh, I'd say a 10-up uh, road right on its coattails, um, benefiting from having myself and other people that really had a lot of experience with what it meant to scale teams and build agencies uh, and serve up, you know, a larger caliber of customer. Um, so in the time since starting it, it's you know, it's the short version, I guess, is just riding that roller coaster, um, scaling up the company starting my first year doing a lot of production work to a point where I do very little production work, 
um, increasingly specializing my time in sort of policy and growth and account and development. Um, and right now, I'm, I'm mostly focused on what it means to prepare Ten Up to continue to thrive and grow and be successful in the years ahead. Mostly not from the technology side, mostly from the sort of business structure and, and accounts and consulting relationships that I want us to live up to. Okay, so John, Jake, could you tell us a little bit about um, your role at this point in the business? And, uh, you know, well, at first, and maybe tell us a little bit about um, today. What's, what's the status the status of Tenna at this moment in terms of size and, and what's just the latest, what's going on? And then we'd like to know about uh, what your role is and what you do day to day. Sure. So, um... So 10up status. So 10up, um, from a personnel size, I think we're a little over 105 full-time staff, uh, plus some contract help. We're working with really exciting customers of all shapes and sizes, a lot of large media organizations, um, a lot of interesting startups. We've helped comp we've recently launched you know, blogs or marketing pages or sites for companies like Flipboard and Dropbox, in addition to some of the large media giants that we work with. So I think we're at a point where we're increasingly selective about the kind of customers we work to, increasingly privileged to work with extremely exciting customers, continuing to grow. I think at the moment taking a path where we're you know, being a little bit more conservative about our growth, going from over 100% year over year. I'd like to see us slow down this year to maybe like 30 to 40% in the first half, in the first, you know, over the course of the year. Really give our teams a chance to really solidify and figure out what it means to be a 100 person plus company. Um, figure out what it means to be a company at the scale. Um, I've always been determined that it's not about the number of people, it's about how much impact we can make while retaining quality. And I think for me, that means right now at the scale that we are, continuing to grow but doing so in a more deliberate way where we have time to make absolutely sure we're still delivering the best. Um, in terms of how I spend my time uh, specifically, it's, you know, I mostly, if there's a, I mean, it's all over the map. I like to joke it's custodial rights, picking up whatever falls down. Right onto the floor. <laughs> In yeah. practice, about probably about a third of my time, roughly, is really what I would call account and business development. Right, it's in key key opportunities for the customer to chase, key relationships, key clients. Let's say about another third of my time is focused on the things that somehow chew up your day as an owner and president: financial reviews and you know, um, you know policy documents and approving, you know, approving uh, higher level, higher impact decisions that are all over the map. Um, and then uh, the third, last third is, is truly miscellaneous. Some weeks it's really leaning into some client projects that can do some extra senior attention, make sure they're, you know, they're on the right track. You know, some weeks it's focused on things like what I'm doing now, which is really doing a lot of preparation for our upcoming all hands meeting. Uh, you know, in Summit and really making sure that that schedule, that agenda, and those sessions are, you know, pushed up in the direction I want it to go. Um, so it's really a mixed bag, but really emphasizing just high-level company ownership responsibilities and account growth and development. Cool. Thanks, Jake. Um, I'll jump in next with, with one or two for you. Um, and one, we've, we've gotten into talking about the agency a bit, uh, but to take one, one step backward, um, why 10 up both in, in name and concept? I haven't seen this, including on, on your site, kind of the you know, origin of the name, first of all. <laughs> so um, I'm trying to think whether to start with concept or name. So let's start with name. So the truth, first thing I have to say openly and honestly, is that my goal was not to come up with an extremely ridiculously clever name. Um, in fact, I actually did come up with a couple of those when I was about to start the company and was, uh, was explained to me by my, at the time, my girlfriend, now my wife, that those were terrible names. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so being a good boyfriend, I agreed. Um, I still agree those were terrible names in retrospect. So my <laughs> rules for naming are having some meaning, but mostly emphasizing things like simplicity, being memorable, being available, um, you know, potentially being transcended across different languages. The idea of 10up in particular was that idea of finishing the last 10% up. It's the idea of the hard part, right? So that, you know, good to okay teams and, and developers and designers get to the get 90% of the way there. The truly, I think, amazing people, the people that really need to ultimately deliver at the end of the day for the right kind of customers, have that ability to do that last 10%, take it across the finish line. 
so that's the that's the uh, I guess that's the story. That's the the, the deeper, not so mind blowing meaning. Um, yeah. So in concept, so the I mean the concept of Ten Up, our mission as a company is to make web publishing and content management simple and fun, right? So our goal as a company is to take something that any of us that have been around for any appreciable period of time, and probably still true today, know that the process of doing online content management can be a miserable one, right? It can be a story of cleaning up broken pages, right, and explaining how to clean up the mess in the editor and the 15 pages you have to click through, right, to get something published. It takes something that I think fundamentally should be a enjoyable concept, right, which is writing and creating content, and at its worst, it can be painful and stressful and annoying. So our goal is really to make that process far from that to make that process an enjoyable one. And that manifests itself mostly what our main business is through consulting services through helping companies figure out how to get their content management in, in a good, easy to use, cost effective place. It also, you know, manifests itself through things like the contribution we do to projects that we think help that mission, like WordPress. It manifests itself in some part through products like PushUp that take what can be very complex and hard things and boil them down to something very easy. Mm. Right through our plugins. But that's the fundamental idea of the business. My belief is that that trend that, you know, Fulfilling that vision is about everything from great engineering, where to me a great experience involves like not crashing, right, and not being buggy and not being broken, to great user experience, right, in design, um, making something attractive, to how we consult, to the fundamentals of how we engage as project team, right, and how our clients interact with us, um, and the experience that they get from a consultant. So that's the grand purpose. Yeah, some great answers. Thank you. Um, next, I just wanted to ask a question briefly about um, the future, you know, and direction of Tenno. Uh, really strong in, in services, obviously, well, really well respected, um, but also getting into the product space as well. You mentioned um, push up, right? Um, so my questions for you are: Are there you know plans to expand expand the product arm of the company? Um, I've heard you talk to other places about how, yes, that would be great, and we have to actually try to limit ourselves from pulling staff members away from service work to develop these, you know, really um, maybe technically, you know, cool um, ideas at, at this point, but that, you know, your bottom line, your bread and butter, so to speak, is is the services. Um, so is that something you're looking to get into more? Yeah, I mean, I, so there's no, the first thing to say is, Services are the core of Tenup's business. I strongly believe in the importance of our service business. There is absolutely no plan whatsoever to pivot Tenup into being like a product company. Like service is just yeah. our way of building products. We are a consulting company. I do think there are opportunities for other inventions and innovations and products in the space that we operate in that fit our mission. Um, and I would like us over time to release some of those. Now, the way I look at it is not necessarily we have a product arm that needs that's going to be selling lots of profitable, you know, products. The way I look at it is most successful larger agencies have a research and development arm, right? They have an arm of the company that experiments with things that are not built for clients, right? With campaigns and ideas and inventions um, that explore right. how to better provide their services. Some of those things can pivot successfully into commercial products. I think that's a huge win um, if we can do that. But some of those things may not become products. Some of those things may become things like Elastic Press, right, that are open source, right, community contributions that we give back. Um, so I do think there are some other opportunities there. There's a lot more to do with push up. Uh, I think we continue to explore ideas that we're working with that are in beta, that we're using for customers in early stages, and evaluate how we contribute those back. If it makes sense in the form of a product or you know in the form of another open source project, um, but I think there is more to see from Ten Up beyond just our services. Yeah. All right. Um, last one I, I have for you before I turn it over to um, one of the other guys here is I'm interested in um, some of the VIP clients, uh, especially being somebody who's coming on board and trying to get a better feel for uh, how how Ten Up kind of functions. Um, how does the process of acquiring those the VIP um, clients work. Is it their they submit an application to be um, a, a VIP client, and then is it automatic? Are the folks behind .com who choose the um, 
you know, agency partner that they, they feel is most appropriate, or is this client pitched like a few options and then it's they choose the one that they feel is the best best fit or that they're most comfortable. You're talking about working. how you're talking about how VIP customers select a vendor and agency to work with them. Right. Yeah. Right. So um, so some of that is uh, some of that. I can speak to some of that. Some of that honestly is even a little bit black box to me. Right. Fundamentally, they go. They typically go to Automatic to to see if they're a fit for their hosting services. Mm. If they determine, you know, which is one way it happens, right? If they go to VIP and determine that you, we want to use you for hosting, or we want to use your services, at some point they find their way to one or many vendors, right? So sometimes it's a matter they have a conversation with a account rep at VIP, and VIP says it seems like these companies that we work with might be the right fit for you. You should reach out to them, or they'll make a formal introduction to those customers. Sometimes they just they don't even they find us themselves. Right? Sometimes they'll look at the services page and they'll just reach out to us or they'll hear about us through a conference or other event. They just associate us with the platform. Sometimes we bring customers to them. Right, So sometimes we have a customer that we're looking at and we have partnerships with many different hosting and infrastructure companies and we find one that's a good fit. Okay. Uh, we're automatic and we bring it to them. Um, I don't think it's different than most other technology partnerships, which is that it's a mutually beneficial one right? where we both see opportunities for the company to be a good fit. It's rarely, to my knowledge, as simple as like we spin a wheel and you're going to go to 10 up, right? So right, it's right. More like here are some partners that we know continue to meet our standards, right, for what it means to build on our platform and continue to really understand how to build on our platform well. You should talk to yeah. a few of them. Here's a few that seem like they're a good fit based on the size of the organization, based on the skills that they have, based on their strengths, and what we've seen, and then we go through a process of vetting them. And oftentimes competing for those opportunities. Gotcha. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Um, so my, my last follow-up question then to piggyback off of that one is um, when is 10up a best fit? You know, I've, uh, to my knowledge, 10up, this real strength dating back has been strong, really strong engineering, you know? Um, and others, you know, I think the focus like range, for instance, you know, maybe more design focused. These days, though, it seems like 10up uh, is becoming really well-rounded. I mean, you have some really great developers on staff as well as um, engineers as well. So is it, what would you say at this point in, in the stage, the greatest strengths are, you know, and, uh, the reason those, you know, VIPs or those who are, you know, pulling a lot of weight in terms of money and project scale and repeat business, um, you know, that possibility, et cetera, when should they choose 10 up? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good question. I, my, my cheesy answer would be is if the budget is a match, always they should choose 10 up. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, the, more, uh, the more, I guess the more uh, direct, the more you know, open answer is, so we are full service. We do all those things. So I think our differentiators are, one, the degree to which we're truly full stack when they're looking for that, right? So it's not, we have very strong engineers, but we also do some great design work. Um, more important than just design and engineering, we have full-time systems engineers that work at the company that can really manage and understand and scale infrastructure, um, whether that's a VIP client or not. I should always emphasize that VIP does not even represent the majority right, of the customers we work with and the projects that we work with. Um, we also have people that do things like audience and revenue development right, that work on things like ad ops strategy and ad, ad revenue alternative testing optimization. Right, we have UX designers, right? So we have a truly full stack team. Mm -hmm. I will say that oftentimes, especially when we're working with large companies that have internal design competencies or may already have an agency of record on creative, which is increasingly common, that I do think our engineering skill is virtually unmatched, right? That it's, I think, if you're looking for the most senior, uh, most trusted partner to help you build a solution, I think both our portfolio, the sort of happy customers we have, having being the only agency that has a lead WordPress developer, you know, a core on staff leading to releases. I think we have I think we have unparalleled credentials when it comes to actually what it means to do very complex engineering requirements. So I think that's often, you know, the combination of a full stack that can get involved in a conversation about things like how to optimize your ads and make more revenue down to the kind of engineering sophistication we have is often what lends what leads people uh, to go our direction. I would also, I guess, I would, the only other thing I would add to that is our scale. I think is a little bit unique among those firms. So the the, mm. the 
benefits you get of working through a team that is 100 plus people that can maybe scale a little bit more on demand based on its bench to meet your demand to have the comfort that we're not a three or five person shop that could, you know, have an owner that goes away and sort of, you know, fall away. Yeah. Right. There's a certain for large enterprises and large companies, there's a certain security and there's a certain power that having our kind of scale gives us. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So okay. talking about scale and the size of your company and, and how and how that's a benefit, you guys use a pod structure. How is that a benefit, especially considering the scale of over 100 employees compared to some of the other agencies? You know, Automatic does things a little differently. How, how do you feel the pod system that you, and, and maybe if you can give a little bit of specifics about how the pod system works, um, why is that a benefit and, and how will that help you scale as you, you, know, you grow another 30, 50% this year, you, you add on that many more staff? Why does it work? Sure, so to give people some background that might not know, so when we say we are organized into a pod structure, we have teams, which are pods, right? So the company is divided up into about 10 or 11, if you count leadership groups and ops groups, different teams within the company. What that means below the sort of like executive leadership operations level, what that means is we have, I think, nine production teams. They're all centered around a senior project manager and team lead. So to answer the question, I think, when we think about what it is we do, we define the core of what we do as consulting and service to a customer, right? Fundamentally, our business is not writing code. Our business is providing customer service, right? And consulting to a customer. So for us, organizing around a project manager, having the central organizer of a team be somebody who's responsible for project delivery and client delivery places the emphasis where it belongs. Now, we have engineering managers and pods. We have directors and UX and design and um, you know, systems that all play strong roles, right? all involve themselves in checkoffs and touch points and vetting plans with the teams. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it is a strength of ours that we organize around project leadership, um, which I think provides both both the kind of resourcing and planning that emphasizes customer success above all, um, while also appropriately emphasizing to our team that the fundamental fundamental leadership at 10UP is in that service, right? is in that project delivery, is in that consulting. And then complementing it again with a strong, what we call dotted line connection to discipline leaders, um, where they're very much involved in the conversation, but at the end of the day, they're not making the choices about how someone focuses their time or where, they, where they're resourced in terms of a project. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, it does. Like, I, I know the design team is their own pod, aren't they? No, no, they're not. No. So designers are actually the designers are actually spread, and UX designers are all spread through pods, um, just like systems okay. engineers in every other role. They, I mean, all of the discipline groups do meet as well, right? So they also, okay. again, spend some time together. Um, but everybody in production at 10UP is assigned to a, to a cross-discipline pod. Great. Um, so about a year ago, you brought in John Ekman as the CEO. What uh, what are the biggest changes that have happened since he's come in? What has he done to, you know, you, you, you felt the need for a CEO at the time. What has he done to really help? Yeah, I mean, I mean, he's helped in many ways. I mean, so the goal of bringing in a CEO, there were several goals. One goal was to be able to scale and do things we need to do at a company of this scale that frankly don't inspire me, right, to get up in the morning, right? So there's a number of things that John does extremely well with an extreme amount of discipline around things like how we have across the company better mechanisms for employee review and evaluation, right? Certain disciplines around how we measure and forecast and manage our financial, right, operations and growth and policies. Um, you know, all the way to things like how do we, you know, being a partner to our other executives like Justin Baskin and how we can execute better, right, for our customers. So whereas I'm very focused, I want to be and have been able as a result of John joining us to be very focused on things like account development, right, like, um, like longer term strategy and those kind of product opportunities, right, and account relationships. John has really, really freed me up. And again, I don't want to give short trip to our other senior executives, Justin Baskin. All of them have really freed me up to be able to focus more on that, right? So John has really taken on the reins of 
of things like finance, right, at the company, of things like policy, of things like mechanisms for reviewing and setting management business objectives, right, and incentivizing leaders at the companies in the right way. Um, and just really been a partner in helping us think about how we succeed for our customers and think about the future of 10 up and, you know, really been somebody that I can collaborate with openly and honestly, and can give as good as he gets, right, and thinking about where it is we need to go and how it is we need to do better. Keep that growth, keep that growth healthy. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. You know, and I think of my, you know, I always think about, you know, I feel an immense amount of appreciation and immense amount of debt to the people that work at 10 up every day, right, to make this company succeed. I am always thinking about how do I make absolutely certain that this company is not dependent on me, right? How do I make absolutely certain that I have the right team where I feel confident this company can continue to thrive, right, in my absence? Not that I have any plans on going anywhere, but, you know, I, I would be irresponsible, right, at a company of this scale to just assume that I'll always be okay, right? That I won't, you know, that a family emergency couldn't come up that takes me out of, takes me away, right, for a month. And for my mental sanity, right, my mental peace of mind. And if I need to step away, right, for a few weeks, right, um, or if something comes up that I have the right team in place. And again, all of our executive team and our leadership, and John in particular, give me that, really give me that peace of mind. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, another topic, Jake, that uh, you get to talk a lot about, um, because you've been doing uh, uh, certainly your fair share of this, is hiring. Um, and so I've got a couple questions uh, about that topic for you. Um, yeah. One would be... Um, you mentioned in a Q and A in Maui a month ago at a WordCamp um, that it's part of your philosophy on hiring is you like to look for people who, um, as you said, haven't quite uh, figured out their entire value. Uh, and I was wondering if you could elaborate just a little bit on that. Why that? Why that? Why you put it that way? Why is it so important to you? And uh, what kind of benefit do you see from like kind of finding that type of person? Right. That's a good question. So. Um... I'm trying to make sure I put it in the right sort of context of the conversation. So, so a couple thoughts here. One is so related to that, and then I'll come back directly to that. Related to that is the notion that as a team, there are different skills and a different set of expertise than you're looking for for somebody that is a solo freelancer, right? A solo independent. Which is to say that the way you find the most synergy in a team is through complementary strengths and weaknesses. Right? The way you find value in a team is by recognizing that not everybody has to have every skill. Right? I don't need somebody who's a polished salesperson right, to be an engineer. Right? I don't need a designer who's the best at managing project timelines right, and goals. I need a designer that is really great at design. I need engineers that are really great at engineering. Right? So finding people that have that have the maturity to recognize what they're not good at, right, and concentrate in some areas, right, we, they, are, they are worth more, right, they are worth more in the context of an entire team, right, because we can give them an opportunity not to worry about their weaknesses and give them an opportunity to lean into their strengths while still delivering through complementary teammates to customers in the way that we need to. So when I talk about somebody that hasn't realized their full value, part of it I think is, is not even a realization question. Part of it is their full value works better at an agency in a team setting. Right? The other part of it is I think great companies take people and help them get better. Right? Great companies take people that are not necessarily at the top of their game right, and have figured it all out, but they take in people that where you see a promise. Right, where you see like you really have some raw fundamental strengths. You're not as, and I think you could be even better in these areas with some mentorship and with some help, right? So to be even more direct about it, right? The person that you bring in out of like college, for example, that clearly has some of the raw material, clearly has the raw skills, right? that person in many ways can be of incredible value to the team because you spend, we spend the energy on mentorship and education and training. And what we hope for is that they have a, they love our culture, they have an affinity for the fact that we've done that, right? They have, they, they like being at this company 
And over time, there's a value there as compared to somebody that already has all that learning that may come in with much higher expectations around what things like compensation, right, and what their cost to an employer looks like. Hmm. I think that's what I meant. Those are the two. <laughs> all right. Um, so given the fact that you do uh, like to hire these these people with potential, potential um, and as opposed to, you know, not necessarily maybe somebody who's an experienced veteran in their craft. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about um, how uh, how that works for you. Because certainly, you're, certainly now you're at a stage where you have, um, like, ex excellent veteran engineers on staff and uh, bringing in someone who hasn't realized the full potential or given the opportunities to flex their skills yet can learn a lot from their colleagues and be mentored um, but uh, certainly there was a time not so long ago where that wasn't necessarily the case when your company was smaller. Um, did you still have the same approach at that time, hiring people with potential, or were you more required to hire experienced individuals? And, uh, and, or if you were hiring people who, even though you didn't have the opportunity to mentor them as much within the company, what, what did you do to help them learn and grow? Um, you know, as, uh, yeah, so I, I, mean, I actually... I actually think it was more the case earlier uh, earlier in our company's development that we were looking for those people with a lot of opportunity to grow. Now I think it is actually harder for us, both because of the expectations that we set and because, um, you know, frankly, because we can afford, right, to bring in people that are more senior and more veteran, right, in their craft. It doesn't mean that we're not still looking for people that have those opportunities as well, but I think... So when I think back to when that question was asked to me, I think it was actually even more in the context of what it means to get started, what it means to sort of build your team. At that point when we were sort of like smaller, I actually think there's more opportunity with the kind of customers you have and more opportunity when the senior members of the team are still have the time and energy to focus on mentorship. There's more opportunity for that. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not actually sure if I'm answering the question directly, but I, I think it was actually contrary to what you might think, earlier in our first two, three, first two to three years, there was a lot more opportunity to bring somebody in more junior and have them work with somebody very senior in a senior position and be mentored. Whereas I think now we're more inclined to bring in people that are very, you know, that are very senior veterans. Part of it's the economics of where we are right now. Um, you know, part of it is just the people that are also really good at mentoring are increasingly squeezed in terms of their time. It still happens. We still want to mentor everyone. We still want to improve everyone. It's just less the case. Hmm. Wow. Remarkable. And very interesting, I think. Um, same topic, slightly different uh, aspect. I was wondering, uh, I'm very curious to hear you elaborate a little bit more on your red flags in the hiring process, or even dark yellow flags, as you've mentioned in, in previous discussions, um, because you do a lot of interviewing. Just talk a little bit about that. What is a sign that someone might not be the right fit for your business? Is Kyle breaking up for anybody else, or is it just my connection? Oh, I, what should I repeat the question? Is it clear now? Uh, it's better, yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, I'm still on the topic of hiring. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about red flags during the interview process, things that are signs to you that someone might not be the right fit if they get far in that interview process, or even just dark yellow flags, as you mentioned before, um, that are just, just signs to you. Okay, yeah. I'll, can you hear me all right still? Yes. Okay, great. Might have just been a flakiness on my side. So you're talking about red flags in the hiring process and things to look out for. Um, so, I mean, Tim, I mean, there are a number of red and yellow flags. Um, one thing that we're looking at is somebody's ability to stay with the job, right? So one thing that's increasingly important to us as we try to scale a remote company is people that can see themselves sticking with the company um, and having realistic expectations of what their company provides them. Um, so when we look at things like resumes and we see somebody that can't stick around at a job for more than, you know, for more than nine to 12 months, right, or even less. Somebody that can't seem to stick around a place for more than a, you know, a year, a year and a half. Um, that, to me, is a sign that they're not going to be with us, 
for more than nine months, nine, uh, you know, nine to twelve months, somebody that you know can't ever seem to find a job that they like to me is a sign that they're going to have you know they're going to have no patience for things we need to do better. Um, they're going to have no patience like to stick with us when we have you know when we have struggles or we have challenges. Right in our workflow, which inevitably happens when you're growing and scaling quickly. Other red flags that I'm looking for are sort of an unwillingness to take feedback, right? Unwillingness to deal well when given feedback or criticism on code samples. Um, you know, I think, I, I mean, to me, everything sort of mostly everything is in that yellow flag category, but definitely the largest ones that I'm looking for are cultural ones, right? Are things about their long term fit, things about their humility and ability to learn um, from the company. Okay, great. Um, all right. So another another business business question, and this this is something that I'm just very curious about. Um, it, it, I would imagine that uh, with your experiences and knowledge that you gained before you started Ten Up, um, you knew a bit of where you wanted to go. You had a good sense what you want to do, what you want this business to be, and what the first steps are. Um, but uh, the, your business has grown pretty rapidly, and so I would also imagine that there's probably been moments where you have said to yourself, "Crap, I I don't I don't really know what to do at this point, um, or right now, or where do I go next, or or just at least I'm hitting a problem I haven't encountered before." Uh, so I was wondering just if you could talk about and some of those specific moments that where that hit you, you went a little farther than you expected, and how did you handle it? What did you do? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, you know, so I'm trying to think how to answer the question. So, I, I think it's possible that being an entrepreneur and being willing to grow a company this quickly may require a dose of hubris, right? And maybe even a dose of uh, a dose of overconfidence. I would never call it arrogance. <laughs> But a dose of you know confidence that you can muscle through those problems, right, and that you can overcome those problems. I don't know that I ever really had moments of like I I truly don't think I know what to do next, right, or I don't know how to solve this problem. I've always been in a very problem solving mentality, and I've worked at small and large agencies and had a lot of experience. I think places where I have struggled are have to do more, you know, are, have mostly been about what the right leadership looks like, what the right sort of like mechanisms to tune and refine culture are like. I don't know, there's something about being an owner and an entrepreneur where you can't, you know, you almost can't even let in that like moment of I don't know what to do. If you ever sort of take that attitude, it almost feels like everything falls down, right? Like you have to sort of take an attitude of here's a new challenge and we can think about this and we can figure this out and we'll get through this. Um, so I feel like I'm dodging the question, but nothing springs to mind as sort of like a oh no moment like where I was just lost. <laughs> I totally understand that. So when you're talking about your pods there, Jake, uh, I, I immediately thought back to uh, military time and said, well, how else would you manage and organize a maneuver element? But it brings me into my first question for you is, uh, what, what inspired you to get involved with Happy Joe? So um, Happy Joe came to us. Um, James Dahlman, who's your founder, came to me to talk about what it was that they were doing, what it is they wanted to accomplish. Um, I, first and foremost, I would say that he made a good pitch, right, for what it is he was trying to accomplish, what it is he wanted his organization to do. Um, I can also say from experience that people that have been, that have the right, you know, technical or, or business skills, and have been veterans or had connections to veterans have consistently been good hires, right? There's something, um, you know, including, you know, whatever this means, I also find like, you know, military, military spouses have been incredible hires for us. I think part of it is that that tends to be a job that blends well with remote because there's a lot of travel and a lot of movement and a lot of, you know, you're not remote, but you certainly don't settle down in one location oftentimes. There's also, I think, something about the experience of that training you go through and knowing you, you know, the buck stops at you, right? There's something about that training experience where there's sort of a no excuses, right, kind of training of, 
you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to hear your sob story about why, you know, why this was so hard for you. That, you know, you understand the importance of your place, you know, your part in the team, right? You understand, you know, you understand that if you fail in your part, the whole thing can fail, right? There's a certain kind of, I think, training that happens that people that have been veterans or work with people, you know, or spouses, people in the military really understand and appreciate that translates into a real sense of ownership and a real sense of responsibility and a real sense of duty in the company um, and a real sort of no excuses, right, mentality and attitude. Um, so combining the fact that I think he's doing a great thing, but I have immense respect for people that have taken the time to serve their company and are trying to the country, excuse me, and have one to serve a company, um, and the fact that I've had consistently good experiences um, with those hires that made me really want to support you know, what it is that he's doing. Well, I just wanted to say thanks on that. Uh, I appreciate it and everybody who's supporting him, what he's doing. Absolutely. So, Jake, I want to talk to you about community a little bit. Uh, you, you mentioned it before. We talked a little bit about, about it before the show. I, I mean, 10 Up is such a big part of the community in so many ways. Um, John Ekman, WordCamp Boston organizer, Helen, lead developer, Drew, 4.2 really. I mean, it, it doesn't get bigger than that. How as 10 Up continues to grow, how, I mean, you far, I think you far surpassed Matt's call for 5%. How do you continue to give back to the community even more? When, I mean, it, do you have visions for that, or are you, do you think that's enough? I mean, is, you, I don't think you can, could a company do more. Yeah, I think they're good questions. We're always looking for opportunities to continue to make meaningful impact there, right? So through sending people to sponsorships, through you know projects people can take on to work on a particular patch. I hope that most of, especially as we grow, most of our contributions don't come through sort of like arbitrary, let me go find a ticket to work on, something to do, but come through the consulting we do, come through a realization of something that doesn't quite work the way you'd want it to. Right, comes through an appreciation for, you know, I mean, Helen's always said like that the consulting, the consulting work she does really makes her a better contributor, really gives her a real perspective for what people are trying to do with the platform and where its strengths and weaknesses are. Um, so I think we continue to contribute in those ways. I also know we want to contribute beyond the walls of WordPress. You know, I, I mean, measurably, if you were to measure the amount of hours that are even just the ones we track on the books, which I think is a small fraction of those numbers that we deliver and contribute to WordPress specifically, it turns out that it would be like our third largest customer. Yeah. Um, you know, whether it's sort of up or down, I think as we scale, we'll continue to sort of like linearly scale with the company, the amount that we give back, the amount that we contribute. I don't have an imaginary line where I say that's too much, right? That's too little. It's, I, I mean, think it's the, organic growth. Yeah, it benefits both in both directions tr tremendously, and, and I, I don't think you could have grown as quick and as big as, as you have without all that contribution and interactions with the community. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I, mean, I think the interaction with the community attracts the right kind of people with the right talent, with the right kind of values we want. I think it gives us, you know, it gives us a strong uh, sense of thought leadership um, that people, you know, people want to give back to those who give. It also makes us more expert at using the actual software. So I think it's, from my perspective, it's been nothing but, you know, it's been nothing but a win for us. That's fantastic, Jake. Um, so I've got a question. You do uh, a fair number of talks at conferences and presentations and things. You're invited to speak a lot. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, certainly for myself, I like to talk a lot of conferences and a lot of the people that I know that do. Um, always thinking about uh, the next talk that one might give. So I'm curious about that kind of thing. That what are there ideas popping through your mind? Like if you were invited to do a keynote presentation at an upcoming camp or something like that that worked for your schedule, you've got to, do you have ideas in mind of talks that I'd love to give in 2015 or just unformed presentations that you think oh it'd be cool to give a talk on that? Um, just just what's going through your head for the future, or do you even think about those things until the moment comes? Good question. I do not spend a lot of time thinking about talks um, that I can give. I actually like to joke that I think I'm in, that within six months I'll have nothing to contribute to a WordCamp <laughs> based on my increasing specialization. Right? Like, I mean, right now I'm so focused on account and company development and business and you know management operational sides of the company that 
you know, I have to actually stop and really think about what is it that what is it that I have to say about sort of the nuts and bolts maker right kind of topics we touch on, touch on on a work camp that I have to contribute. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, I think you know, I think that I have more to offer. I think now at conferences that are more focused on agency and business, right, and customer experience than I have to offer at a traditional sort of maker camp. Um, like a word camp, I think there are some big picture topics that I can talk about. I think there are case studies I can tell about sort of how we apply, you know, a variety of skills, uh, including engineering, to come up with unique, uh, unique outcomes for customers. But as somebody that thinks that word camps in particular are best focused on sort of design and engineering and, and UX, right, and those sort of maker skills. I actually increasingly wonder what it is that I have to say that's interesting to get those. All right. Um, well, from what I've seen, you draw correct credit crowds, so shouldn't have trouble, I think, getting uh, the attention. Just hoping for some tips for Joe. Just the topic. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, real quick, we uh, just have a few minutes remaining. I think we have two, um, two possibly three uh, last questions for you here. Um, one I want to touch on is um, this was something you, you, you said. I think it's been close to a year ago on the Matt report. You know, Matt Medeiros had, had you on for a, a lengthy discussion. Um, and one thing that you said stuck out to me, and I want to ask you about, and that is that you know right now you, at least at that time, you thought that uh, WordPress was you know unparalleled as um, a publishing platform. You know, which uh, with considering tenant submission, right, to make uh, web publishing um, easy, maybe even fun, uh, that's your go-to solution. You know, if, if there were a better tool, you'd probably be using that instead, but WordPress happens to be that most powerful uh, tool that's out there, um, hence all the, you know, contribution and, and giving back that we've talked about, right? Um, but at that time, you also said you, you were a little wary or a little nervous of all the uh, talk of WordPress evolving into full application platform because you said um, if that's what it's moving toward there is stiff competition you know there are, are platforms that do that um, as their focus and do that very well but with all the you know uh, recent development that's that's gone on especially with the rest API really really ramping up and getting close to you know being baked into core uh, what are your thoughts on that now are you still kind of uh, where you're nervous about where things are going with it for net platforms I mean, I think the JSON API more than anything validates my perception, right? I mean, the, so we talk about the JSON API. What's interesting about the JSON API? What's interesting about the JSON API is you don't have to use WordPress as the front end of your site, but you can get content and information in and out of it, right? Yeah. To me, what characterizes the JSON API is actually a validation that, in fact, many times it's not going to make any sense to use WordPress. Mm. Right for the front end rendering of the site. If you wanted to use WordPress as your application platform, I actually don't know why you would need right a JSON API unless I guess the idea is just to let other people get data right out of your application. Um, yeah. To me, the most interesting case studies we've seen of early adoption of the, uh, including some we've done of the API, is this notion of I have an app, I want to get content right out of this content platform. I want people to create content in this content publishing UX, but I want to pull it out of there into my other application, right, or into my other system. So like we helped build a iOS app, right, that in no way used WordPress, right, for the actual app mechanics right. of it, but uses WordPress as a backend to store stories and storytelling Right, and store the content, right? So it's a content platform. It's where they create their content. It's where they manage and store their content. But they're using a different framework, in this case, Objective-C, right? They're, or Swift or whatever you know, it's built on. They're using a different platform to actually get the content out of right, the CMS. So I think, I mean, I still strongly believe more than ever that the notion that WordPress's best focus is applications is misguided, yeah. right? comes from a large community of developers that happen to understand that tool and then want to use it for everything, right? Want their skill to be even more valued and more sought after. And I do think there are instances where WordPress can be a good app platform. It's not to say that there's not good, you know, can't do it or there's not good opportunities. It is to say, like, when I think what the thing that makes WordPress successful that makes large companies want to use it, small companies and medium companies, 
I can tell you that like the small businesses some of you work with that use WordPress, it has their choice has nothing to do with the reasons you choose an app platform, which is like I, I think PHP is amazing, right? And I think it's an amazing yeah. wrapper. It has to do with the UX, right? It has to do with the experience that they're familiar with for actually publishing pages, right, and managing stories. I think choosing not, I think we should choose to continue to lean in on the user experience, on making the the, the, the experience of creating and writing content and managing content and making it easy to, to extend that with things like post types, right, and taxonomies, lean in on making that easier and even better. Continue to strengthen the underlying app pinnings of the platform, but I think folk over focusing on people want to detach the UX and there's a big market for people that just want to use WordPress's function library. Yeah. And build their own interfaces or apps. I, I, I still think is the wrong is the wrong focus. Hmm. Cool. Great answer. Thank you. Hey Jake, I wanted to ask you about your uh, perception on open source information or code. I mean, you've talked, uh, I've heard you talk several times about why uh, open or WordPress is important to you, and part of that reason is because it's open source. Um, but I want to know if there's anything else you're involved in or that you think is interesting in the open source world. So, um, I mean, I think most of the other things that are interesting to me right now in the open source world are things that are like frameworks that are agnostic to CMS. Right, so we're very interested in things like you know things like jQuery and, and, and Backbone and you know open source JavaScript libraries and JavaScript projects that we can contribute to. Projects like Nginx, right, on the system side. Most of the other open source things we're interested right now in contributing to are things that are not about the CMS but are about the tool sets, right, and the toolkits and the systems that enable those platforms. Um, I think there's plenty of other interesting open source CMSs and platforms too, but nothing that really has me eager to contribute or, or focus time and energy on. Interesting. Thanks, Jake. Um, so getting down here to the wire, so we've got just a couple wrap-up questions here for you. Um, I want to know what's on your calendar and where anybody could bump into Jake Golden in, in 2015. Are you going to any events, conferences, anything on your schedule worth noting? So um, my calendar is a good question. Let me cheat here and I feel like I need to check my calendar. So I'm sure I'll go to WordCamp USA, wherever that ends up being. Um, I'm pretty. I'm actually going to have to miss the next one coming up in August. But with the exception of that one, my I'm staying very involved in the Prestige series of conferences, both as an advisor and somebody helping them with talks. I think it's. When I've spoken in the past about wanting to see business and WordPress and business and web really break into a specialized conference that's good at that, I think that team has really done a good job of leaning into making that, um, making that community. Um, otherwise, I don't know that a public events I have in my calendar. I have some private, I guess, you know, speaking engagements and a lot of travel. Um, but I'm actually personally trying to scale some of it back. I'm more than happy to empower the many very talented speakers and experts that turn up to go and sort of represent the company on our behalf at various conferences. I'll still usually go to regional ones if there's a new San Francisco, you know, thing if there's a Portland again. I'll stay around in this area that are easy trips. Um, but otherwise, aside from those sort of like canonical ones like WordCamp USA, um, I'm trying to I'm trying to pull back actually a little bit of the conference circuit. Great, great. Um, so another thing that we try to ask everyone as we wrap up the show is uh, recommendations from you on who else we might ask to get on the show who would be a valuable guest in the future. So I, I don't know if this is like cheating, but I would definitely say if you have not talked to John, uh, John Ekman, our CEO, you should, you should speak to him. Um, he's been in the content and CMS business at agencies that focused on Drupal, on Sitecore, on pre any of those CMSs for over, you know, I think for more than 15 years. I, you know, I, I'm always impressed, you know, privileged to work with him and always impressed um, by how great his breadth is um, and really seeing the bigger picture of what it is we're trying to do as a community and what it is we face. Um, so I, I if, you know, I'd really encourage you to uh, speak with him. And I may have a connection if you if you need an introduction. <laughs> would you do that for us? <laughs> I would. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a great recommendation. Thank you. Um, so that that kind of takes us down to the end here. Um, 
is there anything else that you would like to share with anyone uh, still watching about how they could uh, get in touch with you or anything that you want to plug that maybe people should check out? So, I mean, you can find uh, my rare comments at JKM Gold, which is my Twitter account. I would always plug that we're always looking for a talent company right now. We're actually especially focused on, like, project management and account management, a lot of the business side opportunities. Not everybody knows that in addition to hiring lots of engineers, we are hiring project managers, we are hiring account managers, we're hiring people in user experience. So if you're really interested in the business side of WordPress and uh, you know and are not technical and want to join a really exciting dynamic team that makes you feel like you can do anything, come check us out. That's fantastic. Yes, we encourage everybody to do so. And uh, the Thanks so much, Jake, for coming by the show. We really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Uh, it's really valuable. I think this is a great episode. Thanks for uh, making episode 50 just a phenomenal one. Uh, yeah. so, uh, thanks for making it to 50. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> thanks a lot, Jake. Appreciate it. Great to have you on. Thanks, Jake.